Good evening, uh, everyone. It's great you can tune in tonight. Uh, welcome to all those from CHBC and a special uh, warm welcome for all those who are tuning in uh, from other places. We're uh, really grateful that you can spend this time with us. Uh, before we start our sermon tonight, we wanted to do a, a Q&A again with the pastors, an opportunity for you guys to fire your questions away during the week and uh, give us a chance to answer them. Uh, we have received three uh, submissions uh, for tonight, so uh, without any delay, uh, let's jump into it, guys. Uh, the first question that comes in uh, is this. I'm convinced God heals, but is the gift of healing still present today? Is it a gift people possess like in the book of Acts? Gentlemen. You're only kicking. <laughs> All right, I'm happy to get the ball rolling. Go for it, um, The answer is a little bit complicated. So, yes, does God has still healed today absolutely uh, there are times where uh, you pray for people and there's no doubt I've experienced it from uh, others who have prayed where people have been completely healed sometimes from almost a completely debilitating and in some cases a terminal disease um, so yes uh, God still heals today is the gift of healing a spiritual gift that's a little bit more complex. My understanding of 1 Corinthians, particularly when it talks about and lists the gifts, is that whenever it mentions the gifts, gift of healing, it doesn't actually mention it in singular. It mentions it in plural. So it said gifts of healing. And I think what is emphasized in the Corinthian passage, at least, is that it's not so much a gift given to a, an individual person so much as it is a gift that God may endow upon a person at any given point in time as they are praying for healing from someone. So I don't think it's a permanent gift that resides with a particular person, but rather, as a, by way of an example, let's say Will is praying for someone who's suffering from cancer, and at that point in time, as he's praying, God enables him to pray in a way that causes that person to get healed and it may never happen again and so mm. I think that God distributes it like that uh, sporadically I think when uh, over the time I've been in ministry I, uh, healing is not something that you see commonly in terms of people being healed from terminal diseases it happens I think it's quite rare and uh, I think um, that when it does happen it happens through God enabling whoever it is that's praying to be able to exercise that gift. That's mm. my understanding. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I mean, not a lot to add really, but I, I would just say that you definitely don't see it like you do in the bu book of Acts today. It's, it's quite different, like you were saying, and certainly not as common. And I guess I, I, the only thing I would say is it's important we don't box God in. I think some yes. people want to box God in and say, it's not going to happen anymore, but we shouldn't do that. God is God and we need to not box him in, in that way and he can still heal and he still does. Mm. So that's all I would say to add. Mm. And, and the, I guess the charismatic movement make, claims it's quite normative today, um, but for all those who apparently have the gift, they're yet to take up the challenge to go into hospitals and, and really show that they've got it. So mm. I think there's a lot of counterfeit mm. uh, going on today. But, yeah, very yeah. interesting. Uh, second question that comes in uh, says this. In Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus taught, Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. The question says, could you explain the statement that Jesus makes about throwing your pearls before swine? How does this work with evangelism and is it related? I'll let one of you start. I, I'm happy to answer, but I, you guys need to have a chance to say something. I can first. make a few comments to begin. I, I guess in the context, like that passage is really, it's, it's coming just after it talking about judgment and taking the speck out of someone's eye. So I, I think in the context, it's really showing that we need to be discerning in how we judge, discerning when we take the speck out of someone's eye in how we do it, in who we do it to. Um, and, and then as well, I'd say that idea of taking the speck out of someone's eye could at times come in sharing the gospel. So that might be an example of taking the speck out of someone's eye as we seek to reveal sin in them and then show them how they can be saved and how they need a saviour. So I would say in the direct context, it's probably not really evangelism and sharing the gospel, it's more in judgment, um, but it certainly is a principle, that idea of discernment that applies to many things. 
I guess for myself, when I look at it, I think there's the Sermon on the Mount almost functions like the Proverbs. There's lots of spread out sayings. But I think, I mean, when I look at it, I see ties with evangelism. I feel like Jesus kind of interprets it um, later on when he sends the disciples out and he tells them, go to a house and if they accept your message, let your peace rest on that place. But if they don't, then walk out, withhold your peace and shake the dust off your feet. So in a sense of move on, there's other people that need to hear the gospel. So I feel like that could potentially be an illustration um, of that being played out, which is only a few chapters later Mm -hmm. in Matthew. Uh, Probably another angle, but... Him. Yeah, think? yeah. <laughs> I don't end up uh, making any contradictions here. I, it's an interesting saying because in verses one to five, it's talking about the, the taking the sawdust and the speck out of the eyes. I actually think yeah. there's a change up in verse six. I actually think that it's not part of the preceding context. I think it's one of those kind of proverbial sayings that are, that are given um, and comes not in the context of the previous five verses. Uh, so my understanding of that is that uh, there is a point at which you have to move on when you've come to sharing the gospel with people so that you may have shared it again and again and again and I think you referenced uh, the disciples being told to shake the dust off their feet when they go into towns that are completely uh, against the gospel and they're told to move on. I don't know when that happens but I, I think what Jesus is saying there is, is there are times where Uh, you've shared the gospel, you've shared the gospel, you've shared the gospel, the person's heard it again and again and again, and they are unresponsive, they stubbornly harden their hearts, and so you need to move on. You Mm -hmm. need to move on to someone else, and you you need to to find more fertile soil, if I can put it like that. That, Because it's not our job to cram the gospel down people's throat. No, no, no. And, and you need to find, the, in, in, my, in my view, the fertile ground where God is prepared and, and that person may just yeah. never, yeah. ever accept it. Yeah. And we definitely need to be wise with time. We've only been given so yes. much and we, we, you can certainly waste a lot on some people, I've felt, and it's, and it's not going anywhere. So you Absolutely. do need to move on and God may have someone else that he wants you to be investing into. So 100%. Yeah. Very important, that. Yeah. And this might look a little bit different for with how we evangelize with family because this yes, is a long-term yes, relationship. Yes, yes. So there might be more, obviously, Absolutely. persistence and repetition yeah. over time. Yeah, as that's a good to point. As random people. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Jack. All right, thanks, thanks gents. Um, the third one, this is, uh, is a two-part question based around the same thing. Let me ask the first one and then we'll look at the second part of it. Uh, firstly, uh, the person, it's centered around baptism. Uh, firstly, what is the suitable age for a child to get baptised? Very interesting. Yeah, well, I guess the Bible doesn't put age restrictions on baptism. I guess the requirement for baptism is that someone's repented and believed in Christ, and and if someone's done that, they should and can be baptised. So I don't think there's an age that's put on baptism. Um, if someone's able to believe in believe in Christ and, and trust the gospel, then they should and can be baptised. I wouldn't be putting limits on it. And I guess I'd say as well, we need to... I think sometimes we underestimate kids and we need to see that they can be saved and God can save them. Mm. And as well, that they can be used by God. There's a, there's a way that a, a five-year-old can glorify God. There's a way a 15-year-old can glorify God. There's a way that a 50-year-old can. And, and they can be saved and used by God. So we shouldn't underestimate them and, and nearly not expect anything from them. I think we can sometimes do that, and I've even done that in, in church as well, which isn't helpful. Yep. But should we, um, so not so much at their say, but should we baptise them around that age? Mm. So not necessarily saying that they're not saved, but they might be five, six or seven, but mm. do we take the next step? Hey, they come up to you and say, Pastor Ian, I want to get baptised. There's six mum and daddy standing behind them. Mm. See, that, that, that is the critical question. It's almost... It's almost a misquestion. I, I, I kind of, it's a good question, so don't misunderstand me. What I mean by that is the question I want to be asking is not so much what age should we be baptizing children, but rather am I absolutely convinced that that child, whatever age they are, has clearly understood the gospel and coupled to that has shown me some evidence that they've clearly understood that gospel. Mm. Because if I baptize them at age five, and then at age 15 they walk away from the Lord, Mm. then that baptism at age five 
means nothing. And so I want to be very careful. So it's not that I want to rule out baptizing a child, but mm. what I'd want to do is I'd want to spend a bit of time with that child. I'd want to ask some questions. I'd want to try and dig a little bit deeper and find out whether I think there has been a proper understanding of the gospel. And then I'd want to just maybe step back a little bit and say, can we just give this a little bit of time so we can just see how this commitment to Christ plays itself out so that we, we can maybe see some signs of conversion mm -hmm. and, and some evidence of that before I'd want to rush mm -hmm. into a baptism. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've been in situations where we've baptized young and they've walked away. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that those who are baptized young won't follow Christ the rest of their lives. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that at yeah, all. Yeah. I, I just want to get a little bit more certainty mm -hmm. around it, if I can put it like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've had some come to me, even from this church, at quite a young age, and have done what yeah. you have said. And once you do meet up with them, and you see where they, what they understand someone to be a Christian, what that means, and what the gospel is, you realize quickly with some yeah. that it, they need a bit more time. Yeah. And I, I, it's a hard one, because with it baptism, is, you don't want to give people time, like they're to be baptized as soon as they believe, but... I think with kids, you do need to nearly give that time of testing a bit more yeah. uh, than you would with an adult uh, mm. because they are younger and understanding is still developing. And so. maturity. Yep. Mm. And they're so easily moldable, uh, moldable too. Yes. So as Jose, mm. I will want to do everything that I'm doing. Yes. And so he would say that he absolutely loves the Lord and I want to encourage that. But as he grows in independence, let's see, as you're yeah. more independent, do these desires actually come out of you? Yes. Um, mm. So we want to encourage them in that profession. Yes. Maybe hold off on the baptism yep. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's yeah. good. The second part. Now, this is a little bit longer, and this is a, is, is a bit longer, so listen carefully to it and, um, and do, your, do your best, guys. Does CHBC recognize a baptism from another denomination that were performed in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? like infant baptism by the Prezies or Anglicans or adult baptism on charism in charismatic churches like Bethel, Hillsong and the like. Does CHBC have any specific criteria to recognise a legitimate baptism? And that obviously that second half with Hillsong baptisms and, or whatever questionable churches, here I'm talking about ones done by immersion. So there's a yes, infant baptism yes, yes. and baptism by immersions, but in, from questionable churches. Okay, I, I, I can, I, yeah. since I've been here the longest, let yeah, me yeah, kick go. this one off. Um, I would say to someone asking that question, the first thing is uh, we, we don't believe in adult baptism, we believe in believer's baptism. Hmm. So if there is an adult coming from another church who has been baptized, um, I'm going to deal with the Hillsong one first. They've been coming from an, a church. They've been baptized by immersion. They, they, their baptism, as far as they understand, is based upon their conversion experience. I'd like to talk to them about that conversion experience if I'm sure that uh, it's a genuine conversion experience. And yes, we will recognize that baptism and we will accept that baptism. If we are dealing with someone who's come from a, a different tradition of baptism where it's infant baptism and they've been baptized as a baby, uh, no, our, our response there is no, we don't accept infant baptism. That's why I talked about believer's baptism. Mm -hmm. uh, an infant cannot make that uh, or does not have that understanding of what it means to be a Christian at six months old or, or one year old. And so we wouldn't recognize that baptism as a baptism. Uh, and so no, we wouldn't accept that as a baptism then having said all of that, because there are then those who get baptized as children and then get confirmed at 12 or 13 in the Anglican uh, mm. setup, uh, what do we do with those if for them their confirmation is uh, an acknowledgement of that they have subsequent to their baptism being converted? Uh, we still would encourage them to go through believer's baptism. I would still urge them to be baptized by immersion as a believer. Mm. Um, we wouldn't uh, recognize the infant baptism as such, but we would recognize the confirmation in the sense that that, that might be uh, the fact that they are saved. Uh, I hope that sort of makes a bit of convoluted sense. Yeah. Um, so the answer is yes and no. Uh, infant baptism, no. 
baptism of a believer where it's been genuine as a result of conversion, yes. So it, does, so it's, so it doesn't really matter whether the leadership of that church was questionable or whether they're... It's more if that person was sincere, truly following the Lord. Yes. It's done based on the gospel. Yes. Despite their church, that person was sincere. Yes, that's correct. So I, I'd want to... I'd want to ex uh, be able to say if we are sure their conversion experience was a genuine conversion experience and as a result of that they got baptised, we'll recognise it no mm. matter where it's done. So it's not solely rest resting on the baptizer, yeah. but the person who got baptised. That's right. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah thank you mm. for clarifying that. Mm. Will? Yeah, no, I, I don't have a lot really to add. I think you've covered it well there. Ian, um, and that, and summing up, like it's, it really is making sure that that baptism was genuine. It, did it symbolise what it's supposed to? Yeah. And if it didn't, then it, it hasn't been a baptism really yeah. in a true sense. Mm. So it needs to happen again. Mm. It's not much else to say though from me. Yeah. And that's just part of our process. Yes. It'd be the same with anyone. What's your understanding of the gospel? Yes. What are the evidences of your life? What, what does your spiritual life look like at the moment that you're following the Lord? That's, that's despite right. the past year. All right, I hope uh, that was helpful. We might have another one in the somewhat near future, so keep the questions on you. Uh, and uh, let's look forward to and pray that God would speak to us through uh, Pastor Will's sermon tonight. Amen. God bless you all. Well, good evening, everyone. Today we look at Psalm 119, verse 9 to 40, as we see how to fuel a passion for God's word in us. I shared some of these things with the youth a while ago, uh, but these things have been challenging me again, and I need to hear these things again and again, and I think you do too. So let's first read the passage, and then we'll pray and get into it. So it's Psalm 119, verse 9. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with my whole heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Do good to your servant and I will live. I will obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. You rebuke the arrogant who are cursed and who stray from your commands. Remove from me scorn and contempt for I keep your statutes. Though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counsellors. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. I recounted my ways and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Let me understand the teaching of your precepts. Then I will meditate on your wonders." My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me through your law. I have chosen the way of truth. I have set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, O Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set me free. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding and I will keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find a light. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. Preserve my life in your righteousness. Let's pray. Our Father, we pause right now and recognize that we are in need of you. We need you, God, right now to pierce us with your word, to bring conviction and to challenge us. And I pray, God, that you would do this. I pray that through your spirit, you would work to bring conviction. Do it in my life, God. 
Do it in the life of everyone who is listening. Please, God, challenge us with your word. And I pray, God, that as we come away from this passage, that you would grow in us a passion for your word, that we would desire your word like the psalmist does here. Please grow this in us tonight, God, for your glory. Amen. If you find it easy to read God's word, you always clearly see the beauty of Christ and you constantly burn with a passion for God as you read his word, then this sermon isn't for you. But if you are like me, then this sermon is for you. If you struggle to read God's word and grow, if you see that you neglect God's word, if your mind gets so easily distracted as you sit to read God's word, if you lack a passion for God's word, then this sermon is for you. You need to hear this and do these things again and again until God's word burns in you. It must burn in us. In the psalm, in Psalm 119, verse 14 to 16, it shows the psalmist who loves God and loves his word. And he says this, Psalm 119, verse 14 to 16. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. A person who loves God, loves to listen to him and follow his ways. So Christians are people who delight in God's word. They do not want to neglect it. Christians who don't want to read the Bible, who want to avoid sermons and don't desire God's word are showing that they don't love to listen to God and that they don't delight in his words and that they aren't who they claim to be. If you neglect God's word and you don't care about it and you don't care that you neglect God's word, then be warned. So many people that I have known think they can be Christian people while they aren't Bible people. This is deadly. They spend time, they spend more time listening to the news, a podcast of someone's opinion or Netflix, or the stories of people on Facebook and Instagram. And they spend more time listening to this rather than the living words of God. They have never read through the entire Bible and they don't want to. They may be people, Bible people on a Sunday. They may love the Bible on a Sunday as they listen to the sermon. But they aren't Bible people on their own during the week. They just go on the opinions of others in the Bible and they run to just devotions and good Christian books and commentaries before and far more than they even go to the Bible. And if they do go to the Bible, they don't desire it. They don't want to focus on it. And they don't read it in a way where they enjoy it and live it and obey it. They feel nothing as they read it and they don't change And as well, what they have read just drifts from their mind and disappears like vapor. Is that you? Is that your relationship with God's word? At times, this can be me. Our pursuit of God's word can be so weak. We struggle with half-hearted desires for God and his word. But the Christian who loves God cannot be content with such neglecting of God's word. The Christian who loves God and loves to listen to him cannot be content if they neglect listening to his word. So we must ask, how can this change? What should we do if we have these half-hearted desires for God's word? Well, the writer of Psalm 119 had these struggles too. He had to pray desperately for how he viewed God's word and how he came to it. And we need to as well. 
Psalm 119, it is the longest chapter in the Bible and it's all about God's word. Psalm 119 shows a man who is deep in love with God's word and he has a deep passion for God's word. The whole psalm speaks about his relationship with God's word and the worth that is in God's word. He's obsessed with God's word. Yet, he still needs to pray for his heart to desire it. The psalmist struggles to desire God's word as he should. And so he seeks that he would desire it properly. And the Christian should long for a deep passion for God's word and they should seek it like the psalmist does. God wants his word to be set on fire in our lives. And I hope that tonight Psalm 119 will be the spark that starts this flame and sets God's word on fire in your life. Maybe you wonder why you struggle so much to read God's word. What, maybe you wonder what is going to give me a passion for God's word like the psalmist has. And we're seeing, going to see here that we need to pray the prayers that the psalmist does to get the passion for God's word that the psalmist has. We need to pray the prayers that we are going to see until we have that burning passion for God's word. Pray them. Pray them until those struggles to be intimate with God are extinguished. To be effective in the Christian life, we need to be people who are burning with God's word and have his word burning in us so that we shine it out to others. You can be useful for God and live for his glory. But how can this happen? How can this happen? Well, it comes by God's word burning in us. And you need to pray for this to happen. Well, there are many prayers in this psalm, but I've tried to narrow it down to eight that sum up all of the prayers that will help fuel a passion for God's word in us. And most of them are found in verses 9 to 40, which is where we're going to focus. And you can come back to this passage and use it as a reminder of these things and use this passage to keep praying these prayers. So before you read God's word, as you are reading it, and after you read the Bible, pray these things until God's word burns in you. Pray, God, firstly, incline my heart to your word. Pray that you would, your heart would be inclined to God's word. Have a look at verse 36. Psalm 119, verse 36. It says, Turn or incline my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Oh, how we need to pray this. We want to run to many other things and not God's word. Our hearts are bent towards turning away from God's word and instead turning to selfish gain. We want to just do what we love and fill our time with our pursuits. And oh, how God needs to transform our hearts and turn them to him and turn them to his word. The idea here is that we are like a tree or a vine that just wants to grow up and go its own way. And God needs to use a stake in our lives and tie us to it so that we are inclined to his word. I know that I need God to mold and guide my heart so that it longs for him and his word. And we need to pray for this so that our hearts will not be bent towards so many other things in the day. Because we will naturally always run after other things and not after God's word. And so we need to pray that our hearts would be inclined to his word instead. And even when we are reading, we need to pray this. We need to pray that God would incline and turn our hearts to his word. Our minds start thinking of other things so quickly when we start reading. And so when your mind is all over the place, and when you don't feel like reading God's word, and you want to run to the phone, you want to run to that game, 
You want to veg out on the couch. Or when you want to rush to just starting the day. That one's for me. When you're like that, pray this. Pray, God, my heart drifts and is so inclined to other things. Turn it to you and your word. Bend me and fix me to your word. Incline my heart and my desires and thoughts and emotions to your word. Bend and mend my mind so that I want you and can think on you. But for our hearts to be turned to God's word, something else must happen. Something else must happen. It's the second thing we must pray. We need to pray, God, turn my eyes from worthless things. Pray first, God, incline my heart to your word, but pray as well, turn my eyes from worthless things. Psalm 119 verse 37 says, Turn my eyes away from worthless things and give me life according to your word. Psalm 119 verse 29 says, Keep me from deceitful ways. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me through your law. We slip into so many deceitful traps and worthless junk in this life. Our phones, they are probably... One of the biggest ones, and probably the biggest trap, and often the biggest piece of junk. Paul says, I consider everything, everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. I count it as rubbish that I may gain Christ. We need to see the worthless nature of so much that we pursue. It's rubbish. It's useless junk. Oh, that we would see this. That it is rubbish compared to Christ. Until you see this, you won't turn yourself to God's word and your eyes, they're going to be clouded to seeing the beauty in Christ. So when you come to God's word, pray and also seek to remove the distractions and many thoughts you have about worthless things. You know how much you need to pray this. You know how quickly your mind runs to other things when you sit to read God's word. I feel this. I feel this in my life. I start reading a verse and then my mind drifts for who knows how long. And before I know it, the girls are waking up and I need to start getting ready for the day. And so when you are like this and your mind is drifting, pray, Lord, turn my eyes from what is worthless. Clear my head of the rubbish and fill me with your word. Help me to focus on your word because there is life in your word. We need to turn our hearts from what is worthless because we won't be able to see the wonder and the treasures in God's word if our eyes are fixed on the rubbish that this world offers. And this is why we also need to pray the next thing that the psalmist does. We need to pray, God, open my eyes. Open my eyes to see wonderful things in your word. Verse 18 to 19 say this, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth. Do not Hide your commandments from me. Everything around us is so bright and attractive. This world and Satan dangle so many things that look amazing. And so we struggle to see God and to see his beauty in the word. But we need to realize that there are wonders And gems in God's word. Every verse is full of them if we just open our eyes and take time to look. If we just pray that God would reveal them to us, then there are treasures for us to see that are beyond compare. And we need to see them. We need to see them because when we see them, We will hunger for God and we will be set on fire for him and we'll have a passion for him if only we would see them. The psalmist in this chapter, he has shown the worth and the wonder 
that is in God's word. And yet he still has to pray that he would see these things, that his eyes would be open to these things and that his heart would be inclined to them. This is the nature of our sin. We have something so wonderful before us, but we fail to see it. And instead, we run to worthless rubbish. So you need to pray. As you come to God's word, pray, Lord, open my eyes to see wondrous things, to see you in your beauty. Open my heart, God. I want to see you. Do not hide your word from me, but show me your glory. And as you pray this, we need to work hard. You need to work hard at opening your eyes. You need to sit with God's word. You need to read it again and again to see the links that are there in the passage, to see what the author is saying. You need to ask as you read, what glorious things does the author want me to see here about God? What does the author want me to see? To read a passage properly, you need to be asking this. What does the author want me to see? You need to ask this rather than just quickly running to and asking the question of how can I see the gospel here? You might get a passage wrong if you just run to doing that. You might miss the weight of what that author is saying if you do that and just run to the gospel. You need to first ask, what is the author wanting me to see? And so think about the passage. Think. Open your eyes. What does the author want you to see? And pray as well that God would open your eyes to see it. Next, we see in the psalm, the psalmist prays that God would teach his word to him. And we need to pray that. We need to pray, God, teach me your word. Psalm 119 verse 12 says, Praise be to you, O Lord, teach me your decrees. Verse 26, I recounted my ways and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Verse 68, you are good and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. And verse 124 to 125, deal with your servant according to your love and teach me your decrees. I am your servant. Give me discernment that I may understand your statutes. And there are many more. We need to plead with God for understanding. And the psalmist does this again and again. And I know that sometimes we don't go to God's word because we don't understand it or we don't think that we will when we go to it. But we need to realize that the Bible was written to be understood and used every day by ordinary people. But unfortunately for the so-called Christian, it often isn't. It often is neglected. Don't neglect it. Come to it. It was written to be understood. And don't, as you come to it, don't overcomplicate things and don't do away with what the author says. Normally, the face value, plain reading of a passage is right and what the author is trying to show us. Often it's our preconceived ideas that make us get things wrong and make us try to fit in ideas into a text and means the text gets completely blown up. And so we need to come to the Bible simply accepting the hard things that God is saying. We need to come to the Bible more like an eight-year-old who just accepts what is said says, said, and reads it simply. And as well, we need to come, as we come, and when we struggle to understand, we need to pray and ask for God's help. God wants us to understand. He can give us insight. He's given us his Holy Spirit so that we can understand. So ask for help. Pray and ask that God would give you understanding. Pray, God, teach me your word. Show me what you are saying. Help me to not take things in a wrong way. Give me an understanding according to your word. But it doesn't just stop at teaching and understanding. In this psalm, the psalmist wants understanding so that he can meditate and obey God's word. 
And then the next two prayers that we're going to see. The fifth thing that we see the psalmist prays is he prays, God, give me understanding so that I may meditate on your wonders. Verse 27, it says, Let me understand the teaching of your precepts, then I will meditate on your wonders. Pray that God would give you understanding of his word so that you can meditate on it. What is meditation? What is it to meditate on the word? Well, the word to meditate means to utter or speak something. And so to meditate on the Bible is to speak it again and again to ourselves. It is to chew on it again and again, speaking to ourselves about God's word and how it challenges us. As you read, you need to pause and think on God's word until he gives you insight. And until it burns in you, you need to think and ponder and speak God's word into your life. That is what it is to meditate on it. So many Christians are useless and ineffective in their service for God. They don't grow and they don't grow others around them. And it's because they don't chew on the bread of life. They don't meditate on God's word. They don't savor the spiritual food of God's word that can give life, that can transform us and save people. If you want to be passionate for God, feed on the bread of life. Feed on the bread of his word, which is the only thing that can energize a passion for him. Chew on it again and again trying to get every bit of sustenance out of God's word as you read it. Think on that one verse or that one word and how it fits and, and what God is saying and why he wanted that verse there. Think on it. Think. Think. Even on the words that you think are unimportant or even on the verses that you think you've read so many times and understand so well. Think on them and pray. Pray, Lord Give me understanding so that I may meditate on your word. Help me to think on your word and reveal your truth to me. Cause your word to permeate every part of my mind, God, and every corner of my life. And then six, we need to pray, God, give me an understanding of your word that brings obedience Pray first, God, give me an understanding that brings, that causes me to meditate on your word. But now, God, give me an understanding of your word that brings obedience. Psalm 119, verse 33 to 35 says, Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees, and I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and it should say the word that there, that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the paths of your commands, for there I find delight. In verse 133, direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. When you pray and when you read God's word, you must pray that those things you read wouldn't just stay as knowledge. You need to pray hard that it would transform you. You need to pray that you would understand so that you do actually obey. If you read and it does nothing in your life, that is useless and pointless reading. Instead, pray and plan how it should change you. God's word is to transform us. It is designed to equip us to obey God and to serve him. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Ken Ramey suggests here from this verse that we need to ask the following questions from passages as we read them, and I think they are so helpful to ask. He says, we need to ask, what did I learn? That comes from the idea at the beginning of the verse that says in 2 Timothy that God's word is useful for teaching. So we need to ask, what did I learn? And then we need to ask, he says, where do I fall short? That comes from the point of reproof. 
And then he says, we need to ask, what do I need to do about it? That's because 2 Timothy said, God's word is useful for correcting. So what do I need to do about it? And then the fourth question, how can I make this a consistent part of my life? That's the idea behind training. You need to do this as you read God's word so that you would seek to obey it and live it and let it transform your life. And also, you need to pray like the psalmist does, particularly in verse 34, that God would give you understanding so that you would live out his word. Well, seventh, the seventh prayer that we see here is the psalmist prays, God, keep your word near me. God, keep your word near me. We see this at the beginning of our passage, verse 9 to 11. It says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And verse 43 says, Do not snatch the word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. We need to ask God to not let us stray or wander from his word, but instead to help us live by it and to keep us near it. And the way God does this is by storing it up in us. Our lives can be guarded and kept pure when God's word is memorized and used in the moments we need it. So pray, God, keep your word near to me. Store up your word in my life. Do not let me wander from it. Help me to memorize it so that my life may be guided, guarded by it. We need to pray that. But also don't just pray this, but seek to memorize God's word. The psalmist says that God would keep him from straying from his word. He, he prays for that. The psalmist prays that God would keep him from straying from his word. But at the same time, the psalmist is storing up God's word in his life. How are you doing at storing God's word up in your life, at hiding his word in your heart? Without Bible memorization, we can't have the Bible meditation that needs to happen every day. Psalm 1 says that we are to meditate on God's word day and night. If we aren't memorizing God's word, we can't meditate on God's word day and night. Memorization fuels meditation on God's word. It allows us to live according to God's word in each day. Memorizing verses isn't just for kids. We, as Christians, need it desperately to fight sin and to endure in the Christian race. And we neglect this today. We neglect memorization so much because we have access to everything. We have access to everything right here in our pocket, on our phone. And this is destroying our minds. And we think we can't memorize because of this. But I want you to know that you can memorize God's word. It doesn't take much. If you just read a verse five times, again and again, five times in a row, and then try to say it five times without looking, you'll probably know that verse, and you'd be able to move on then to the next one. In one hour, if you set aside one hour of focused memorization of God's word, you would be surprised what you could remember. You'd probably be able to remember 10 to 20 verses. I challenge you to do this. I challenge you to set aside time to memorize God's word. And I challenge you, church, to do this together. Let's do this together. Maybe let's start with this passage here, Psalm 119, verse 9 to 40, and let's memorize it together. Let's learn these verses together. If you set aside five to ten minutes each day to learn maybe one verse, you'd be able to remember that whole passage in a month. So let's do this together. Let's seek to memorize God's word and then use this passage as we memorize it to pray 
over our desire for God's word. And then finally, the last prayer here that we see in the psalm that I want to draw out is this prayer that he prays. He prays, God, give me life in your word. Give me life in your word. Verse 25 says, Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. I am laid low. I'm laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. Verse 28, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Strengthen me, he prays, according to your word. Verse 37 says, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. God can give life, true spiritual life. He can save and he uses his word to do it. James chapter 1 says that God's word is able to save our souls. God can truly satisfy through his word. There is life. There is strength and delight in God's word. And that's why the psalmist prays for these things from God's word. He prays for life from it. He prays for strength. And we see the psalmist delight in God's word. So you need to pray that you would be satisfied with God and the wonders that you see in his word. You need to pray that you would see his word as life and not everything else, that you would be satisfied in his word, not satisfied with everything else that you can have in life, with good friends maybe, or family, or thrills from the latest hobby or toy that you have, but be satisfied with God and the true life that is found in him and his word. So pray this over God's word as you come to read it. Pray, Lord, help me to find life in your word. Make it my delight. Make it my strength and satisfy me with you in your word. Well, if you struggle to read God's word and want to find delight in it, and want to have a passion for God's word, like the psalmist does, then pray these prayers that the psalmist does. Pray these things daily to ignite in you a passion for God's word. I need to. I have to do this when I come to God's word. Otherwise, it will become so dull in my life. And as you pray these things, seek to do them in your life as we've been seeing throughout. At each point, I made the challenge to pray the prayer that the psalmist does, but I also gave the challenge to do those things. And that is what we need to do. Yes, we need to pray them, but we also need to do them. We need to turn our heart to God's word. We need to turn our eyes from worthless things. We need to open our eyes to the wonders that are in God's word. We need to seek understanding. We need to meditate on God's word. We need to obey what it says. We need to memorize it. And we need to find life in it and be satisfied by it. And we need to pray that God would do those things as well. Pray and do these things until God's word boils up in you. Don't let go of God's word until it is set on fire in you and until you are transformed by it and until you are ready to share that with others. We need to be people that would be gripped by God's word, like the psalmist. We need to be a people that have a burning passion for God's word so that we can be useful for God's kingdom in spreading his word. So may you read God's word and may you think on it and may you pray over God's word until it comes to life in you and, t- and until it burns in you and until you have a passion for God and a passion for his, you, his word. May you pray these things. Pray these things that we see in Psalm 119 and go back to verses 9 to 40 to remind yourself of them and pray those things until God's word is burning in you and you delight in God's word and you want to run to it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you For the psalmist, we thank you for his desire for your word and we pray, God, that we would grow to be like him. We pray that through your spirit, you would do this work in us. We know that this is the only way it is possible. We thank you, God, that 
by your grace, you have saved us and you have made us born again and that we are new creatures with your spirit now. We thank you, God, that through your spirit, you can ignite a desire for your word in us. You can give us understanding of your word through your spirit. You can do these things, God. And so we pray that you would. And I pray, God, that you would really help us to use these prayers that the psalmist prays in our life. May we pray them when we are dull and when we aren't desiring your word as we should. May we not be content with such a weak desire for your word, but may we pray and hunger to love your word and delight in it like the psalmist does. Please grow us in this, God, and transform us for your glory. Amen.